I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. I think this is one of the most, now not the most, but this is one of the most important messages that I know in the Bible. I'm about to share it with you right now. So why don't we start with prayer and then we will get into, as I said, one of the most important messages that I am aware of in the Bible. Let's bow together and pray, and we'll ask for a blessing. Our Holy Father, I want to thank you so much that you've given us this opportunity to be with you again in what we're calling your house right now. Your people have gathered, and I am blessed to be here. I have really enjoyed this time with you and these people, and I pray you'd please continue to help us to learn and understand what it is that you're saying to your church. We thank you so much for the Bible, your holy word. We pray that it would transform us, that we'd be able to hear this morning something that would enable us to be able to share the message of truth with others in our vicinities, where we live, where we travel, perhaps where we go to school, where we go to work, in our homes, in our neighborhoods. Give us wisdom and direction. May we be able to understand just what it is that you want us to know, and I thank you for this. Praying that you'd bless us with not allowing me to speak, but rather help us hear your son. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Revelation 13 is a very important section of the Bible. You see, I guess before we go there, I could even go to a different section. No, we'll go there. Revelation 13. Now, what's fascinating about this section of the Bible is that it is used in many different ways with many different interpretations. Now, some of you may, might be aware because I do have this presentation online, but if you've never seen this, I encourage you to take notes. Uh, I do have notes online, so if you have access to the internet, you'll be able to get them there. But if you don't have access to the internet, please take notes. Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> the reason being is, we know that God the Father is being attacked. Is that true? We also know that the Son of God is being attacked. Is that true? We know also that the Spirit of God is being attacked, right? We also know that the angels are being attacked. All of God's heavenly agencies that are working together for our salvation are being misrepresented here on this world, in this earth. In Kenya, but also in California where I'm from, in America. It's happening all over the world. We have this attack on the truth about who God is. And we will be able to see in the book of Revelation here, I hope a very eye-opening and exciting way to look at the Bible. Because we will be able to see what it is that is being attacked. And so, Revelation 13 verse 1 says, I, John, stood upon the sand of the sea. Now, would you consider John a Christian? What do you think? Do you think John was a Christian? Yeah, I think he was a Christian. Now, I have a question though. Why is a Christian standing on sand? I thought Christians are supposed to be on the rock. Right? So what is John's business there on the sand? I think that's interesting because, don't you remember in Matthew chapter 7, I'll find it here. It says that whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and winds blew and beat upon the house and fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does not do them shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and the house, what? Fell. And it was a great fall. Or great was the fall of it. So, 
What is John doing on the sand? John is a Christian. He should know better. He was there when Jesus was speaking on the uh, Mount of Blessings. He shouldn't be standing on the sand. He should be standing on the rock. But what's interesting is John, I think, is mentioning the fact that he was standing on the sand for a purpose. The reason being is he knew that we needed to understand that at this point, he was on the same foundation as what he was about to describe. Okay, you with me? Yeah. I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast. I have a question for you. Okay, now, here. Let me say it this way. You guys probably are familiar with this prophecy in a prophetic sense where you would interpret things. Like, for example, if I said, what does the sea represent? You would say what? People, right? Multitudes of people. Because Revelation chapter 17, verse 15 says that it's multitudes of people. But I want you to stop thinking that way this morning. You with me? The reason being is, I want you just to look at the actual, literal, what's happening. Okay? So if I say, what is the sea made up of? Are you supposed to say water? Or are you supposed to say people? Water. water. That's right. So now, now, you you, now you understand what I'm talking about. So now, I stood upon the sand of the sea, so he was on the sand, and I saw a beast. Was Christ ever referred to as a beast? How? Yeah, he was the Lamb of God. What else was he? The Lion of the tribe of Judah. Was he another beast? What about Moses being told to put a serpent on a pole? Christ was a serpent, illustrated by a serpent. By the way, it was a brazen serpent. There's a real reason why it was brass. Should I tell you? Okay, okay, okay. So, brass is what is called an alloy. Do you know what an alloy is? Are you familiar with that word? It's a mixture, right? It's what I call, an, or what the dictionary calls, an admixture. It's a mixture of more than one metal. It's an alloy. And so alloy is made up of copper and zinc. You put copper and zinc together, you get bronze. Okay? That's interesting, isn't it? So a brazen or bronze serpent made up of copper and zinc. Now, what's interesting about copper and zinc is that one is what's called a baser metal. And the zinc is called a finer metal. That's the, 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 the zinc. And so you have two metals, one a baser and one a finer, and they are combined together to make one alloy. I tell you, Christ is an alloy. He has a baser nature and a finer nature. And they are brought together as an alloy. He is and was the brazen serpent. Isn't that amazing? Oh, you'll never think about it differently. It's just incredible, right? So, yes, he was a lion. He was also a lamb. He was also a serpent. So Christ was a beast or an animal. So John is standing on the sea. No, he's standing on the sand of the sea. And he sees this animal. And what does the animal do? The animal rises up out of the sea. Now, when an animal rises up out of the sea, what would that make him? A fish. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. That was great. I loved it. No, not a fish. <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it, would, it would make him wet. <laughs> oh, I will never forget that. That's hilarious. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. That was great. So this, this beast 
rises up out of the sea. And so as a result of coming up out of the water, he's wet. <laughs> oh man, that was great. I will never forget that moment. <laughs> okay, so when this beast comes up out of the water, he's wet, right? Did Jesus ever come up out of the water and was wet? Yes. When? Wet, yeah, that's right, when he was baptized. And so this animal comes up out of this water, but he has seven heads. So you can see it right there, seven heads. You see that? So I'll focus on that one for a second by highlighting it. He has seven heads. Now, did Jesus ever have seven heads? He said yes because of the lamb. Are you sure the lamb had seven heads? That's right, he had seven eyes and he had seven horns, but he did not have seven heads. So did the, the lamb, that is. Did G, that's in Revelation 5, verse 6. You can check it for yourself. Did you ever see Jesus with seven heads? No. But did Jesus, rather, let me say it this way. Did this beast look like the one before him? Okay, similarities. Now, what do I mean? Did he look like the one before him? I'm going to go to Revelation Chapter 12, verse 3. Now, why, why do I said before, why did I say before him? Well, Revelation 12 is before 13. Right? So, does Revelation 13 beast look like the one before him? Yes. Revelation 12. Notice what it says. There appeared a wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having how many heads? Seven, Seven heads. Okay. <laughs> so if you have seen the dragon, you have seen similar, you've seen the beast. If you've seen the beast, you've seen the dragon. Could Jesus have said something similar? Because does Jesus look like somebody as well? Does Jesus look like the one before him? Yes. That's why in John chapter 14 verse 9 he was jesus was speaking and he said have i been so long time with you philip and yet you've not known me he that has seen me what has seen the father because he looks like the father mostly in character because the father has never taken on flesh you understand and so what we see here according to revelation chapter 13 is this beast that came up out of the water that, just like Jesus did, he looks like the one before him. And Jesus also looks like the one before him. And so now this one has 10 horns. Did Jesus ever have horns? When did he have horns? Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Let's turn there. Revelation 5, verse 6. Now the Bible says, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, in the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. Now who is the lamb in the book of Revelation? Jesus Christ. Every time except for one. There's 29 times in the book of Revelation the word lamb is used, and every single time except for once, it's referring to Christ. That would be Revelation 13, the second beast has lamb-like horns. It's Christ-like, but it's not referring to Christ. So here, we have this lamb as it had been slain, having how many horns? Seven. Seven horns. So does the lamb, does Jesus Christ have horns? Yes. And so just like this, um, having seven heads and ten horns, just like this beast has horns, Christ also has horns. Now, upon his head, there are ten crowns. Did Jesus ever have crowns? You say yes, but when? Do you remember? Okay. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Okay. 
So the beast in Revelation 13, verse 1, he had crowns. And Jesus has many crowns. Do you know what's interesting? If you go to early writings, page 53, you will find that on that page, Ellen White says that they, he, there is upon his head a crown within a crown, seven in number. Right? That's pretty interesting, isn't it? So he actually has seven crowns. I used to think that he had three crowns. The reason being is the Pope's tiara has how many crowns? Three. One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Spirit. I think it's directly related to the Trinity. But Christ has seven crowns on his head. And so I just think that seven is the fullness, the, the complete number. And so now, when we go back to Revelation 13, notice what it says. Upon his heads was the name of blasphemy. Okay, so he had a name written on him. This beast did. Did Christ ever have a name written on him? What do you think? What? Yes. In Revelation 19, verse 16, the Bible says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And so when Christ comes, he will have written on his vesture and on his thigh a name. Well, this beast in Revelation 13, he has written on him the name. Probably a similar name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Why? Because this power claims that he has the same position as the Son of God. He is the Vicar of Christ. And so why, if Christ can wear King of Kings and Lord of Lords, why couldn't this power wear King of Kings and Lord of Lords? You see what I'm saying? Now, according to Revelation 13, verse 1, Jesus is a beast just like this power. And this beast comes up out of water just like Jesus does, or did. This beast has heads or looks like the one before him, just like Jesus looks like the one before him. This beast has horns, or yeah, horns, and so did Jesus. This beast has crowns, so did Jesus. And this beast has a name written on him, so does Jesus. What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. Before the personation occurs after the close of probation that we can read about in Great Controversy, page 623, we can see that Christ is being personated right here before us. Can you see it? So what happens is, Revelation 13, verse 2 now says, The beast which I saw, you know, the one that looks like Christ, he was like unto a leopard. Was Christ ever like a leopard? Okay, I see. I heard, mm -mm, and I saw heads shaking no. Now then it says, his feet were like the feet of a bear. Was Christ ever like a bear? No. And his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. Was Christ like a lion? Yes. Oh yes, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, leopard, bear, lion. Notice what the Bible says. Go to Hosea 13, starting in verse 4. <laughs> Hosea 13, verse 4. The Bible says, I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me. Now, that would be God the Father. And he's the one that called the children of Israel up out of Egypt. How did he do it? Through his Son. All things are of God by the Son. Okay? Thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. That is God the Father. What do you mean? God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God is our Savior. How did he do it? Through his Son. Amen? All things are of God through the Son. Now it says in verse 5, I knew you in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. There was no rain there. You were in the wilderness. I knew you then. In fact, it says, according to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. In other words, they were eating grass because I led them to the right place and they were exalted. 
That's why they forgot me, the one true God. Notice what it says in verse 7. Therefore, I will be unto him as a lion, as a leopard, by the way, I will observe them. I will meet them as a bear. Did I just read a lion, a leopard, and a bear? Now, we're talking about God the Father, is that right? But if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if you've seen the Father, you've seen the Son. And so right here we're looking at the Father that looks like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Or is going to be represented as a leopard, a bear, and a lion. So what's fascinating is in Revelation chapter 13, you can see that this beast, he looks like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Isn't that amazing? Absolutely incredible. I've never, I've never been able to read that and think, oh, that's, that's nice. It, to me, it just blows my mind that this beast here in Revelation 13 looks so much like who he is trying to personate that the same symbolism is used in the Bible. To me, it's absolutely incredible. It says the dragon, who's the dragon? The dragon is the one before him, right? Because that's in chapter 12. So the dragon gave him his power, his seat or throne, and great authority. Okay, so now we can see here that somebody before him gave him power, seat, or throne, and great authority. Could we say of Christ that somebody before him gave him power, throne, and great authority? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Are you telling me that in chapter one, 13, verses 1 and 2, we have every single point illustrating that Christ is being personated by the Antichrist system? Yes. And no wonder so many people are deceived. You see why this is important? Okay. So, so far we have, they're both beasts. They both look, come out of water. They both look like the one before them. They both have horns. They both have crowns. They both have a name written on them. They both look like a leopard. They both look like a lion. They both look like a bear. They've both been given seat, power, and great authority. How many is that? Twelve different points in two verses showing that Christ is being personated by the Antichrist power. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? I think it's incredible. Now look at verse 3. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Was one of the heads, if you will, the one that has the Godhead or the divinity, was one of the Father or the Son wounded unto death? Yes. Praise the Lord, our Savior was resurrected. Amen. And guess what? So is this one. Watch this. I saw one of his heads as it was wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. What do we call a deadly wound that is healed? We call it resurrection. You're telling me that the Antichrist power has also personated the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Oh, yeah. No wonder it says... All the world wandered after the false Christ. Because all those points that we talked about, remember we counted the 12? And plus, they were, he, one of them was dead, and the deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered. Now, watch this. This is interesting, because if you go to John chapter 12, John 12, and I think it's verse 19... Yeah, there it is. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how you prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. So they're talking about Christ, and they said the world has gone after him. Could you say of Christ, the world wandered after Christ? Yes. <laughs> the world has wandered after the beast. The world wandered after Christ. They both have horns and crowns and the name written on them. They both have come up out of the water. You, so, you see what I'm saying? This is incredible, absolutely insane, because we can now explain 
why there are so many people who are following the Antichrist system. You know, you've, you've been asked the question before. Yeah, Saturday is the Sabbath, but how can so many people be wrong? Have you been asked that question before? Yes. Have you asked that question yourself before? Yes. Now we know. Because the Antichrist system looks just like Jesus. And the Antichrist system has led people into a false gospel that is leading people into Christless graves. And guess what? It has even entered the Seventh-day Adventist Church with the Trinity Doctrine, given to us full stop by the papacy. Well, the coming papacy. It was Rome, basically. It was the ecumenical movement there in 325 in Nicaea. But that's where it comes from. And then it was made official according to uh, the traditions of the fathers and entering into the Catholic Church where they finally accepted and, and had full-blown authority in 538 when they were given civil authority just as well as the religious authority. And then, if you didn't follow the dictates of their conscience, including the truth about or the falsehood about the Trinity, you were then killed. This is serious business. You remember why those three tribes were plucked up by the roots? Why? They were called Aryan tribes. What did Arius believe? Arius did not believe in the Trinity. Arius was a believer in the only true God that had a son. Now, whether Arius believed that Christ was created or not, I do not know. I don't think he believed that Christ was created. I think that just, okay, when you're t talking to a Seventh-day Adventist pastor today, and you say, Jesus Christ was begotten, he will leave saying, he thinks Jesus was created. But is that what you said? You didn't say that Jesus was created. You said Jesus was begotten. But they will say that you think Jesus was created. So now go back in history and Arius is teaching that Jesus Christ was begotten. What could potentially be said about Arius? That he believed that Jesus was created. But did he probably say that? No. The Bible never says Jesus was created. And so I think we can understand that Arius as the leader of the Arians, was a believer in the one true God, or the only true God, the Father that has a Son. And no wonder those three tribes were plucked up by the roots, because they were non-Trinitarian. Guess why we're going to be plucked up by the roots in the future? We're going to be non-Trinitarian. We're going to be Arians, if you will. So I saw one of his heads as it was wounded to death, but that deadly wound was healed. There was this false resurrection that was being personated, and all the world wandered after this beast. Now, we have seen a lot of similarities between this beast and Jesus Christ. Would you be able to go and share these thoughts with somebody right across the road? and tell them and explain to them that there is a system in this world that is doing everything it can to look just like Jesus? They don't know who it is. You don't have to explain who the Antichrist is. All you have to do is tell them that there's a beast and that Jesus was a beast. And you tell them that the beast came up out of water and Jesus came up out of water and that this beast looks like the one before him and that Christ looks like the one before him. And you can tell them that they both have horns and they both have crowns and they both have a name and they both look like a leopard, a lion, and a bear. And they both have been given power, seat, and great authority. You can teach them all about Jesus Christ and they don't even know that they're learning about the Antichrist. And then when you expose who the Antichrist is, they're like, oh, it all makes sense. You see? You can share this message with anybody at any time. And they'll be like, wow. You can really see there's two Gospels. There's two that you could follow. And you tell them, yeah, you're right. And if you don't study the Bible for yourself, you could potentially be following the Antichrist when you think you're following Jesus Christ. That's where the rubber meets the road. And so there in chapter 13, verse 4, they, that would be the people in the world that are wandering after the beast, they worshipped the dragon. Who's the dragon? Come on now, the dragon's the one before him. Right? So now, when we worship Christ, when we follow Christ, what are we really doing? We're worshiping the one before him. 
Right? All glory goes to God. That's what it says in what it, Philippians chapter 2, right? Let's see. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted his Son, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. Why? And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. When we worship Jesus Christ, we are worshiping the one before him. When you worship the beast, you are worshiping the one before him. Identical. Same exact mechanics. <laughs> you see that? Wow. And they worship the one before him, which gave power unto the beast, which is the one after him. And so we worship the one before Christ that gave power unto Christ, which is after him. Even chronologically, the father came first, right? And they worshiped the beast also. They didn't just worship the dragon, they also worshiped the beast. And just like we worship the father, we can also worship the son. Amen? And they said, who is like unto the beast? <laughs> you ever seen that question before? Who is like? Help me now think. What, is that, what does that question bring to your mind? Mikael, the Michael. Jesus, one of Jesus' names in the Bible is Michael. What does Michael mean? Who is like God? So they're asking the question, who is like unto the beast? I think there's a play on words there. I can't find anybody who knows Greek and, uh, well enough or has done this study to be able to help me understand if there is a play on words there. But I think there is because, I mean, it's an obvious parallel that we're personating Christ. And why would you ask the question, who is like, if you know that one of his names is, who is like God? Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Okay, Satan, I have a question. Who is able to make war with Christ? It wasn't you. You were in heaven and you were cast out. You can see that in the chapter before, right? There was given unto him, which is this beast that personates Christ, a mouth speaking great things. Now, did Christ have a mouth speaking great things? Yes, absolutely. In fact, one of the great things that I have seen recently, I mean, within the last few years since studying who God is, I think it's 59, Mark 15, 60. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it, these witness against thee? Well, Jesus held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ? The son of the blessed? Okay, so the question came up yesterday. Is the Christ, or was the Christ, the anointed one, the one that was assumed to be the son of God by the Jews? Right here is the answer. Are you the anointed one? Are you the Christ? The son of the blessed? So they understood together that the Son of God would be the Anointed One. They just didn't think it was Jesus. They knew that God had a Son, they just didn't think it was Jesus. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Living God, or the Son of the Blessed? Jesus answered and said what? I am. I am. <laughs> you think those weren't great things coming out of the mouth of God, the Son of God? Let me tell you, Jesus died because he said those words. Those were great things. He was able to answer the question, I am the Son of God. I think that's amazing. So here in Revelation 13, verse 5, there was given unto him, this false Christ, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Did Jesus ever speak blasphemies? No, but what's interesting is the things that he says that he was accused of speaking blasphemies for 
are the same things that this Antichrist system says that are blasphemies. Right? So watch this. You go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 20, 27. So I'm looking at it, right at it there. Okay. Therefore, son of man, speak unto the house of Israel and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God. Yet in this, your fathers have, what's the next word? Blasphemed me. What did they do? How did they blaspheme? In that, they have committed a trespass against me. Do you know that committing trespass against God is blasphemy? Did you know that? It's right there. That's what it says. Most of the time, we only talk about Mark chapter 2 and John chapter 10 about blasphemy, right? You remember those. Mark chapter 2 says that if a man claims to be able to forgive sin, what is he doing? He's blaspheming. What about in John chapter 10, verse 30, and, and around that area, if, if somebody claims to be the Son of God as a human, what does that mean? They're blaspheming. But at the same time, if you commit trespass against God, you are blaspheming. That's what the Bible teaches. And so what we have here is this system, this false antichrist power that is blaspheming. He is breaking the commandments of God. He is claiming to be a man on earth that can forgive sin. And he is claiming to be a man on earth that is God. Right? They both claim the same things. In fact, Jesus, remember when he healed on the Sabbath day in Matthew chapter, or John chapter 5, verse 18, they were really angry and they sought to kill him because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but he claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be that, that God was his Father, that's right. Okay, so that was given both of them a mouth speaking blasphemies. Now, listen, power or authority was given unto him to continue how long? 42 months. Question. And this is not a trick question, it's a simple question. How many months are in a biblical year? Twelve. How many months are in two biblical years? Twenty-four. Good. How many months are in three biblical years? Thirty-six. How many months are in three and a half biblical years? Forty-two months equals three and a half years. What's going on here? Does that also equal 1260 days? Are you telling me that 42 months, a time, times, and a half a time, 1260 days are the same amount of time that Christ did ministry while he was on this earth? <laughs> you mean Christ did ministry for a time, times, and a dividing of time? He did ministry for 1260 days or 42 months? Yeah. Wow. So even in the sense of time, the Antichrist system is doing everything he can to personate Jesus Christ. Amazing, isn't it? And so you're able to show somebody right across the street that there's parallels in every single thing that the Antichrist system is doing to be able to share with them about Jesus and that there's somebody who's trying to mimic and deceive. So now they're going to understand that, yes, there's Sunday, but it's an impersonation of the true day. Yes, there are false diets out there, but that's only personating the true diet. Yes, there's liquid, but it's personating God's liquid. You know, alcohol and water, etc., with juices and, you know, fruit juices and, and uh, vegetable juices and all that good stuff. You can go on and on. There's, everything is personated. When you share these thoughts with somebody, you'll be able to explain to them not only end time events, but also the truth about Jesus Christ in the one true God scenario. And you'll be able to help them prepare their minds to understand that there is true and there is false. Today in the one true God movement, we've got lots of stuff going on. One of them, one of the big ones is that we are being taught a false understanding of sin. But there is a true understanding of sin. And if you have the false understanding of sin, you're going to have a false understanding of righteousness or justification by faith. And the same thing will occur on the other side. If you have the truth, you're going to be led to understand the truth. And so we need to understand that there's plenty of things to know in regard to these truth and error scenarios. 
So they both open their mouths in blasphemy against God. Now Jesus, of course, didn't against God, but they blasphemed his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. So you can go on in your own time and find the rest of these things that go on, but you, you'll know that certainly up to five, verse five, we have perfect parallel in every single situation that shows us that there is a false Christ. And this false Christ is trying to personate Jesus Christ right now before he personates Christ in person after the close of probation. You can read about that in the 39th chapter of the great controversy called Time of Trouble. So, what's interesting about this is that we're only learning about the sun here. But if you go back to the one before him and you look at the dragon, you will see that the dragon personates the father. And you will see that the one after this beast, which is the image of the beast, he personates who? The Holy Spirit. For example, with the Holy Spirit, he is lamb-like. He comes down from heaven as fire. He puts a seal on the forehead or a mark on the forehead. He causes all to worship the one that was before him. He exercises all the power of the one before him. You see how this is working? And the image of the beast will lead you to worship the beast and the dragon. See how that works? The mechanics are identical. The false father, the false son, the false spirit. Now some people will say, well see, everything that is uh, personated demands a true. And so there is a trinity because you can see in the book of Revelation there's a false father, a false son, and false spirit. No, 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 no. There's no trinity. There is a real father, a real son, and a real spirit. But that doesn't make up a trinity. What we have is a trinity that has replaced the idea of the one true God and his son and his spirit. And so when you do the, your homework and you look at the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, you're able to help somebody understand that in the center of the book of Revelation, you have this war being described between those that are going to follow the beast in his image and those that are going to follow the father in his image. Did you hear what I said? The beast and his image, the father and his image. Who is the image of the father? Jesus Christ, his son. That's Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. And so at the end of time, we're either going to worship God the father and his son receiving the day that they have given, which is what day? The Sabbath. Or we're going to worship the beast in his image and receive the day that they have given. Which day is that? Sunday. So do you see how you can lead somebody through these visual pictures of the beast coming up out of water, having horns and eyes and a name written on him, etc., looking like the one before him? And they don't know that they're learning about the mark of the beast and the seal of God. They're learning about the truth of, of the Father and the Son. They're learning about the Son being personated. They're learning the foundations of the Antichrist system from 538 to 1798. And they're also learning the center focus of the book of Revelation. The entire book is about worship. You will either be led to worship the false God or the true God. That's really what it's about, isn't it? The book of Revelation is amazing. It starts out with a picture of Christ in chapter 1 that's followed by seven churches. It's followed by a picture of Christ in chapter 5, followed by seven seals. There's a picture of Christ in the beginning of chapter 8, followed by seven trumpets. Did you see what just happened? Christ, seven churches. Christ, seven seals. Christ, seven trumpets. That's the first half of the book of Revelation. Now, why does it go Christ 7, Christ 7, Christ 7? Because the book of Revelation, literally, is trying to show you that it's covering the same history three different times from three different focuses. You don't take the trumpets and put them in the future. Sorry. It doesn't work that way. That You will destroy the book of Revelation the way it's laid out with the sanctuary. Because in the book of chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, you have the candlesticks, Right? And then in chapter 4, you have 4 and 5, you have the table of showbread with, as the throne with two on it, two stacks of bread. 
That would be the Father and the Son. Then you have, and of course, the, the Spirit proceeding forth from the throne there, which you see is the candlesticks in chapter 4. So you have the candlesticks in chapter 1. You have the table of showbread in chapter 4 and 5. You have the altar of incense in chapter 8. Come on now. Then you have the um, Ark of the Testament in chapter 11. And finally, you have the coming up out of the Ark of the Testament and setting up the tabernacle there in Revelation 21. So you, what you've seen is, oh, oh, by the way, in chapter 15, you have the glory of the Lord coming upon that tabernacle. So you have the candlesticks, chapter 1. You have the table of showbread or the throne of God in chapter 4 and 5. You have the altar of incense in chapter 8. You have the Ark of the Testament in chapter 11. You have the glory filling the temple in chapter 15. And then you have the final uh, temple complete, if you will, in chapter 20 and here on the, the earth with the final tabernacles in 21. So the book of Revelation lays out the sanctuary just like that. And you can see the same thing with the, uh, uh, the festivals. You wanna see the festivals in the book of Revelation? I'll just give you all this real quick. I'm not going into the details. I'm just giving you the overview so that you can continue studying and be able to see these things for yourself. Now, in Revelation chapter 1, you will see in that chapter the most references to the death, burial, and resurrection in the entire book of Revelation in chapter 1. Because remember, it says there's the sevenfold blessing in verses 5 and 6 where it talks about that he was the... I'll just turn there real quick. We'll see it. Revelation 1, verse 5. It says, from Jesus Christ, who is the, number one, faithful witness. Number two, the first begotten of the what? Dead. dead. He was dead, right? So he was begotten of the dead. That's the resurrection of, from the dead. So there's two of them. And the prince of the kings of the earth. That's three. Unto him that loved us. That's four. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. That would refer to his death, right? His blood. That's number five. And hath made us kings and priests unto God. Uh, his father, that's six. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever, that's seven. So there's the sevenfold blessing there of Christ in chapter one, verses five through six. In there, you can see references to his blood, his death, his resurrection. You go on, in, like in verse seven, for example, it says that every eye shall see him and they also which, what? Pierced. pierced him. What does that piercing refer to? The time when he was on the cross and died, right? So he was pierced. That's the death that's being referred to. And then you go on and you see that he had brazen feet. Brazen feet? What, what, is, what is brass referred to? The finer and the baser metals combined, right? You got this alloy. But now what was brazen in the sanctuary? The altar of sacrifice. Christ had brazen feet as though they burned in a furnace. Why does his feet look like they were brazen and burned in a furnace? Because he was on the altar of sacrifice. In fact, you can see that in Amos chapter 9, verse 1. I'll just go there. Amos 9, verse 1. Notice what it says. It says, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar. Where was he standing? Upon the altar. And he said, smite the lintel of the door and the post that they may shake. Of course, that was for the Passover, right? That's when you put the uh, blood on the doorposts. And so what we have here is Christ standing in the context of the Passover on the altar. What kind of altar was that? Brazen. No wonder he has brazen feet. So even in Revelation chapter 1, when you're seeing the brazen feet, that's because he was standing on the altar of sacrifice. Now, it's, he says he has hair like, that's white like wool. Where do you get wool from? From sheep, and what is a sheep referred to in the sanctuary? Something that is killed, right? So again, you're referring to the death of Christ. You go through chapter 1, in the death of Christ, his resurrection, his burial, it's all over it. Chapter 1 is loaded with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why, why am I saying this? Because the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the wave sheaf was the first weekend and the first part of the spring feasts. All in chapter 1. What do you have in chapter 5? Remember chapter 5, verse 6, Revelation 5, verse 6, where it talks about there's this lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are, 
Okay, so we're about to learn what the seven horns and the seven eyes are. There are seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. When was the full, complete gift of Christ's spirit sent forth into all the earth? Pentecost. So are you saying in chapter 5 we have Pentecost? Yes. What we're seeing is there is the death, burial, and resurrection in chapter 1, which is the feast of Passover, unleavened bread, and wave sheaf. And then a short time later, 40 days later, 50 days later, there is Pentecost in chapter 5. Now, what follows Pentecost? The first of the fall feasts is the Feast of Trumpets. What do you see in chapter 8? Trumpets. And then what comes after trumpets? The Day of Atonement, which we see in Revelation chapter 11, when, remember, the ark is opened and you can see within the ark there's the testimony, right? You guys with me or am I losing you? Some of you are kind of going to sleep now. Are, do you understand what I'm saying, or is, is this working or not? Yeah. Start again? Okay. Chapter 1. You have the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Most reflected in the book of Revelation. That refers to, in the sanctuary, the pe feast of Passover, unleavened bread, and the wave sheaf. That was the first weekend. That was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Jesus died Friday. He was resting Saturday in the redemption. Remember, he rested in creation. He also rested in redemption. So he died Friday, he rested Sabbath, and he resurrected on the wave sheaf. When you were to wave and uh, that which had been raised from the ground and had been harvested, right? That's what you're waving. So you're talking about the death, burial, and resurrection in the first chapter of Revelation. And then in chapter 5, you have when the seven spirits of God were sent forth into all the earth. That was Pentecost. So you have the first three feasts and then Pentecost right there in chapters 1 through 5. And then the next feast that comes in the yearly economy of the Jews was the Feast of Trumpets. And what do you find after chapter 5 where trumpets are involved? Chapter 8, the trumpets. After the trumpets, you find the Day of Atonement. And that was in chapter 11. And I'll just read that one to you, Revelation 11, verse 19. Oops. Um, what do I got here? 11, verse 19. It says, The temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices, etc., so what's interesting is you could actually see inside of the temple and see the Ark of His Testament. What time of the year was the only time of the year you'd be able to see the Ark of the Testament? The Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. So what we've seen is the first three, which is Passover, Pente um, Passover, Unleavened Bread, and Wave Sheaf, and then Pentecost, and then you see the trumpets, and then after that you see the Day of Atonement. What is the last and final feast? Tabernacles. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 21. Oh, there it is, three. Sorry, thank you. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold the, what is that word? Tabernacle of God is with men, and he will tabernacle with them. So this word is skene, this word is skenu. He will tabernacle with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. What you've seen in the book of Revelation is the sanctuary with the candlesticks, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, the glory filling the temple, right? So what you've also seen in the book of Revelation is the yearly festivals in chronological order going from the first all the way to the last. So that's why I said you can't take the trumpets and put them to the end of time because that would destroy the sanctuary model of the book of Revelation. Isn't that amazing? So all of this that I'm telling you about is something that you'll have in your head so that you can continue to study and realize that the book of Revelation is laid out in the sanctuary model. And you can find a lot of stuff in the book of Revelation if you study the sanctuary. And so Christ has been personated and we need to understand more about how the truth is described so as to be able to find where the error is and expose it, right? Have no fellowship with the fruits of darkness. Rather, reprove them or expose them. 
Amen? So, Jesus Christ has revealed himself to this group today in a way that he is ministering in his sanctuary, but also in the way that he has been personated. I beg of you, do not hesitate to share the truth that you know with people that are around you. People are falling into Christless graves every single day. They are being lost because they have been deceived and their life is being taken. Do service with Christ to teach people what is true, that they can have the light of life as you have in your life. And that we'll be able to rejoice together in heaven. What do you say? Amen. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you've given us the opportunity to be able to learn a little bit more. I pray that you would please continue to educate us. Give us diligence to study the Bible, your word. Help us to not only know these things, but be transformed by them. I believe today we have heard some truth, and I know that we are to know the truth, that it will set us free. Free from the darkness and corruption that is in this world. We want to be set free, Lord, but we don't want to be set free alone. We ask that you'd please set out before us the paths that we are to take, both all together, but also individually. Because I know that you want to lead every single one of these people to somebody who doesn't understand the truth yet. And you want to expose the errors. You want to lead people to accept your son. I ask that you'd please give us opportunities to do that and to do it quickly. Help us to be diligent students and diligent witnesses as well. We don't want to do it in our own power, Lord, because we would fail. We cannot do it. We ask that you'd please bless us with your spirit that we could minister together. We can co-work with you through your son, through the mediation of your son. We ask also that your angels would be with us. They would go before us and prepare the hearts that when we do share the seeds of truth, they will find a ready place to bring forth some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Glorify yourself as we continue to learn today and continue to fellowship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.